Uh, turnabout is fair play. I will thank Jen for giving that talk on data which is not her own. It's very uh, difficult to speak about someone else's data. That's why I delegated that responsibility. Uh, <laughs> so I don't think what people realize, I am not a gene therapy expert either, but this data is jaw-dropping. It is that significant, and that's what all the gene therapy people would say. So we'll have to qu I'll speak a little slower than my usual cadence, and we'll still have time for lots of questions after I'm done here. So one thing which I've said is, I guess I've recruited with, uh, talked to Ferris about a potential therapy, which I've made joking reference to many times, is if we could simply perform time travel, we'd be able to go forward into the future find the cure, and then go backward into the past. For some reason, they have not yet funded that. So let's do a little time travel experiment right now. My first slide, which I believe is blank. Let's time travel back to 1997, March. It's a conference room in the neurology department at the University of Pennsylvania. And a young and impressionable pathologist walks in and says that he's been working on this disease called Friedreich Ataxi and has an idea for a clinical study. And Kurt Fishbeck says, yeah, that's a great idea. Who can do it? Well, there was a young impressionable neurologist present in the room that day. <laughs> <laughs> young, impressionable, who for some reason said, okay, I guess I'll take the lead on this. And for that's really how our program at the University of Pennsylvania CHOP was born. That was 15 years ago. Uh, you've seen various bits of the research since then, but what is the really tangible things which have happened in the past 15 years? One, we've seen about 250 patients with Friedreich ataxia and evaluated from a research or clinical perspective. We have an estimated 1,500 visits of patients to either CHOP or the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. We've performed roughly 1,000 clinical rating scale examinations between drug trials and everyone's natural history visit. We've had 4,000 trials of the nine-hole peg test. For you patients out there, we'll come to what that means in a few seconds. We've done 5,000 of those low-contrast letter acuities where you can't see the gray on white letters, and I explained that I can't either. We've drawn roughly 1,000 research blood samples. We have 100 urine samples. I delegated that one as well. Uh, as well as 25 skin biopsies. That's as of today. Who knows after tomorrow? 30 treadmill tests, which those of you who have been with us a long time remember taking place in the oldest building at the University of Pennsylvania where we were all scared to be, and that had to do with mice, which were not Helens. <laughs> About 100 uh, op optical coherence tomography tests where we measure the thickness of your retina. 50 speech tests, 30 hearing tests, about 300 echoes which we've taken for external review and run through our centralized data processing system, and about 500 different quality of life questionnaires. And we have enough paper where if you were to stack it just like this from our file cabinets, it would be 40 feet high. I hope there are no tree conservationists here. So we've done a lot of work. The question is, what have all those samples been used for as we reached Friedrich Ataxi in 2012 with that same young, impressionable neurologist still smiling after all these years, or still crazy after all these years, called Paul Simon. Another way to look at this, though, is what do we have to prove in clinical research before we do a clinical trial? That's equally relevant in 1997 as now, because as Jen explained, this, rapid, this crucial new potential therapy, what do we have to do on the clinical research time to take a mouse therapy and turn it into a human paracord? And finally, for the patients, the very practical question, was the pegboard really worth all that torture? So if we travel back again in time to 1997, we had, Rob told us that day that under, expanded GA repeats led to underproduction of taxin. This is predicted to lead to a sensitivity to reactive oxygen species production. It should also lead to iron accumulation in the mitochondria. These things should lead to cell death, and the features, of, and these things lead to the features of Friedreich ataxia. That's Friedreich ataxia in 1997. So there are only two things to do. We thought at that moment, the first is figure out how to make a drug that works. And you've heard today from Jim, from Jen, uh, if Dr. Miller were here from Edison, he'd be telling you about how their drugs may also have efficacy, and I'll show one slide later about that. Maybe we've done well on that, but there's a second aspect to making a drug that works, figuring out how to prove that that drug works, because these two things are not necessarily the same thing. 
Remember, we cannot prove that a drug does not work. We can only prove that a drug does work. It is a, you can't prove a negative. What this gets to is two very crucial questions. How do we measure Friedrich ataxia in people and do it with a scientific fidelity that can convince external individuals, specifically regulatory authorities, as well as other physicians that we really have done the right thing? And you have to know the size of this effect. Jim alluded to this somewhat in the number of individuals who might be responsive, but you also have to know what amount of response you expect to see. Because if you do not know the amount of response you expect to see, then you're not going to be able to judge the potential benefits against the potential side effects in any individual. As we have alluded to, all drugs potentially have side effects. So what we need to know is not only how these things come about, which you have to know the variability between people of response. So in 1999 to 97, what did we say? Well, if we look at that one, how is it uh, for tax and regulated? Have you heard about a variety of therapies, but you also have to know to, how to measure them? Not in a dish, not in a mouse, but in a person and correlate that with disease. You, predicting that reactive oxygen species, species production is important. Guy Miller would talk about his compounds would might slow it down, but how do you measure it and prove it to a regulatory authority? How do you assess whether iron accumulation in the mitochondria is important? Well, we see this, but is it a causal event in humans, or is it what we call an epiphenomenon? Something which occurs in people just because they have disease, but that does not really cause the disease. These things lead to cell death. Well, again, how do we measure it? And cell death and dysfunction leads to the features of FA. How do you measure that? Remembering that most people will talk about how their MRI scans in FA are normal. And one final question is, we know that for taxin changes the, uh, the course of the disease and levels of that. Does anything else? I was asked earlier about what causes the difference in age of onset, and I said that 50% was unexplained. If you knew what that other 50% was, you'd have a much better way to figure things out. So let's again continue our time travel experiment. It's the first international conference on Friedrich Taxi organized by Farah in 1999, when I was about 26 or 27. <laughs> and Pierre Ristin got up and talked about a molecule which was foreign to most of us, perhaps maybe all of us, called a debenum. And he reported some data from mice, where if you gave it to the mice, it slightly delayed the onset of the cardiomyopathy and uh, slightly prolonged lifespan. The pro and he reported results of a preliminary cl clinical trial, open label in humans, more or less, we have it, it's approved, we can give it. It decreased the cardiac hypertrophy when given at six months at a dose of five milligrams per kilogram. These are the original studies on adebinone and FA. What do we think of those 13 years later? Well, if you get the privilege of hindsight, and that's something we always get, if you look at those studies, there was no placebo group. And what's more important is we had no natural history data on what actually happens to cardiac hypertrophy in FA. At that point, we did not know. We did not know, in fact, that some people's hypertrophy goes away even without therapy. We did not know that that's more likely if the individual's had more hypertrophy. And we did not even consider the possibility that those early groups were very, very hypertrophic individuals where it's much easier to detect a benefit than it is in a group of individuals who are the typical FA patient. So I made reference to this early today. In fact, many of those early studies were biased to see a benefit. That benefit is probably real, but we we're biased to overestimate that. And now the FDA, if they were here today, I, I don't see them in the back. Uh, they'd ask a very fair question. What does cardiac hypertrophy mean in terms of the future life experiences, be it arrhythmias, be it diastolic dysfunction, or be it cardiac failure? And the answer is, we don't really know exactly what hypertrophy measures. So what was the value of the trial by Pierre Stan? It was very, very important. It forced us to sit in a room and develop a systematic clinical research approach to Friedrich Ataxia. Fortunately, Rob was at that meeting. I was there for a brief period, and Rob was there as well, and he was kind enough to volunteer me for that effort as well. <laughs> He's gone, I can say anything I want. <laughs> so what do we need to know if we're really gonna uh, go forward? And this is Friedrich Ataxia in 2000. We need to know how people change, and we need to know it in a quantitative manner where we can estimate how variable that change is, how much different is the course between different individuals, and, if we, and how can we explain that variability. 
What that means, though, is that we need a heterogeneous population. We don't want everyone to look the same as they come in, because then we're simply going to select for the people who change in one way. We need a group of individuals, much like this audience here today, who have been assembled over uh, almost a generation of us. That means we need large numbers. Large numbers, I will remind you, tends to cost large amounts of dollars, which our good friends at Fair and help uh, and the MBA have helped us with through the years. That would allow us to know. Do we need a large number? Uh, one of the reasons we need that, and this is for the more statistically attuned people in the audience, we all know that as one gets older with free recce tax, your disorder gets worse. Just being very simplistic. In addition, we more or less know that the length of your GA repeat length, the longer it is, in general, the worse the disease is. If you're going to separate those two effects to modify any variable and figure out what makes something worse, you have to be able to separate those two independent variables on your dependent variable, which is disease severity. What that means is, practically speaking, you need at least 30 to 40 subjects in any study to be able to separate that. That's based on power calculations, what we call linear regression analysis. So the next time you read a Friedrich Ace Taxia study based on a clinically heterogeneous population, if it does not tell you about at least 30 to 40 subjects, and they claim that they can separate effects on age and GA repeat length, you should be highly suspicious. It's not statistically very powerful to do so. So what do we need? In 2002, we decided we would start a longitudinal natural history study. That's what brings many people to see us, which we call the Friedrich Ataxic Clinical Outcome Measure Study, or FACOM for short. I will credit Susan Perlman with that abbreviation because that's quite important. I can't pronounce anything that fast. In 1999, when the uh, trial of Adebanon was proposed by Pierre, we had no way to measure the disease. We had no measure which would tell you what really was worse in a person with Friedrich ataxia. We, it takes basically getting a group of people together in a room and getting them to agree. A simple task when you're dealing with academic physicians, correct? Dream on, my friends. Uh, the original centers were the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania, UCLA, Iowa, Minnesota, University of Texas Medical Branch, Mississippi, and Emory. Over, what we basically did is took an exam created by Sub Subramoni, and we would all agreed we would do it the same way. We also said we would all use some torturesome tests like pegboards and timed walks and vision tests and do them on everyone who came through the door and watch what happened over time. Really simplistic at the... Uh, at one level, but crucial at the level of actually moving things forward. We have continued this through the years, through the kind support of Farah, and we're now following not the original 150 patients, but about oh, greater than 600 patients at these original centers at the University of South Florida, University of Melbourne, that is Melbourne in Australia for the record, uh, Chicago, Rochester, Ohio State, Toronto, and University of Florida. As many of you know, we have a travel reimbursement which is limited. You cannot travel to Melbourne and get your visit reimbursed, just for the record. So we've been following individuals now for a long time. We also realized over time that we could collect some other things besides just those exams and get much more interesting information. That includes collecting a sample of blood to isolate DNA for what we call modifier gene analysis, which I will show an example of in a minute. Jim made reference to the lymphocyte RNA that Giovanni Coppola has used to map, uh, look at the responsiveness to HDAC inhibitors in a test tube. He's done the same thing within our population. We have those RNAs collected and described through a paper which we had come out about a year ago now on what is different about FA at the lymphocyte RNA level. We've also now banked plasma looking for cardiac biomarkers, which we haven't even decided what they are, but that stuff sits in a freezer in my lab, as well as peripheral for taxin levels because we do have to be able to measure uh, for taxin if we're going to show that gem compounds work or if we show that a generalized gene therapy approach would work. So that measure, what actually is the FARS exam or free directed taxi rating scale? The, it's what I do every time I meet you. It's a quantified neurological exam where I give numbers to this, this, and this, and it allows us to map how your disease changes. Everyone says that I'm the proponent of this, but I didn't invent this. Sub Subramoni actually did, and they've been working on it for five years before we actually met, so Sub gets the credit for this. We agreed that everyone would do it identically, and in fact, the data works out that we basically do that. 
Traditionally, this is how you measure a neurological disease. Let's suppose instead this were Parkinson's disease. You would have a quantified neurological exam. If it were Huntington's disease, you would have a slightly different quantified neurological exam. If it were motor neuron disease, you would have a quantified neurological exam with an emphasis on uh, motor function and strength. We tailor it to the disorder to make it the most sensitive for that disorder, but basically it's a neurologist quantifying things in a semi-subjective way. That has certain issues. For example, neurologists tend to be a little bit biased. I'm a neurologist, I can say that. Uh, and it doesn't always work out as well. Instead, we also invented, because this is what they do in multiple sclerosis, highly quantifiable tests such as pegboards, which I know you all love, and timed walks, and reading letter charts, which look at basic functions. How do you use your arms? How do you use your legs? How do you use your speech and your vision? And realizing that we could probably do a better job with those. These are more indicative of what you do in a daily living scenario. And uh, thus, we've chosen to go forward with them as well. So now, we've collected these 600 individuals. We've been following them for up to nine years now. What's the information that comes out on the other side? Or do we just do this every year because we do it every year? No, I can assure you we don't. One of the things which any measure must be, it's consistent between with exam between examiners. And when we go and meet with the FDA, they will ask, how are you measuring your disease and is it consistent between people? Well, we have to have statistical evidence that it is. And in fact, we've proven that that exam is the same across those original seven examiners in a paper that Sue put out around 2005. In addition, we've proven that it is similar but for torturesome measures like the pegboard. So, and in fact, the pegboard may be more quantifiable. So that works as a valid, reliable measure. In contrast, it doesn't work for echocardiograms that are done in people's offices in a non-systematic manner. In fact, if you've had multiple cardiologists, you might even be able to relate the fact that they didn't do the echo the same way every time with the same type of machine. So when you try and combine data, that can be very problematic, not from a clinical interpretation point of view, but from a research point of view. This is one of the reasons that echocardiograms are sometimes difficult to use as research measures in FA. What else comes out? Well, we have to prove that these really measure disease. How do you do that? You show that over time, as a person, if in, in a cross-sectional manner looking at people of different ages and different GA repeat lengths, your FARS exam gets worse, your pegboard gets worse, your vision test gets worse. This has basically been proven. How do we need to do that? We needed to collect people in a room and measure them over and over again and prove it. Not the most exciting thing, but crucial for drug development, as Jim Rushi would tell you right now. We also have to show that it depends on genetic severity and the people who are more severely affected genetically. You would like to see that your measure is that way, and that's true for our performance measures, our peg words, our vision tests, our FARS exam, all those sorts of things. In addition, and perhaps the most important thing which the FDA asks us about, is that measure must match what you all tell us is going on in your daily life and your activities of daily living. That's why we ask you those painful questionnaires about what you do every day and your health-related quality of life. Each of our measures we have are indicative of those things, thus they can be used as surrogates for those, as a more quantifiable surrogate for those in a therapeutic trial. That is crucial information. And when you go around to individuals like Jim or individuals from other pharmaceutical firms, that we have this information documented is a crucial component that they use to get investors to help move their drugs forward for this disease rather than others. What else comes out? We can also tell you the speed of change, how fast people change on average, and we can even figure out what makes people change faster or slower. I can tell you that for a FARS exam, it's 3.1 plus or minus 3.7 units per year, but that means absolutely nothing to you. Only means, means a little bit to me. But it should one thing you can take away from it. That's the average, that's the standard deviation of change. People vary as much as they change linear in a year. Now, that is not a wonderful ratio, and that's why sometimes if we can, we can use these for other purposes. For the performance measures, it's really about the same. We know it's variability. We can also tell you what makes people change faster. It's dependent on sex. For some reason, the FARS exam, but not performance measures, women change faster than men. We've tried to explain this. We can't do this. We haven't been able to do it yet. We know that uh, uh, age is important and GA repeat length is important, how fast people change. 
But we can take all those numbers and we can put them into a calculation which would tell Dr. Rushi if he wanted to see a 50% slowing of neurologic progression in Friedreich ataxia, this is the number of people you would need in order to have an 80% chance of seeing that effect. That's what this ratio allows you to do. That is a crucial component. It also allows us the privilege of 2020 hindsight. One of the things, we mentioned that adebinone has given equivocal results over the years. If you go back and now cheat and look at the phase three adebinone trial and the amount of benefit which was observed in the actively treated group, we can tell you we didn't have enough people based on the expected variability to prove that. This is not a criticism of Santhera, it's just showing you that we do have 20-20 hindsight and we can use it to move forward to power our next study much better. So these are things which we have to know if we're going to do clinical trials. So we had collected all these individuals, Some, we started collecting all your cardiac data as well. And this is, these are probably the thickest parts of the uh, paper that we collect from you. We can tell you that we take everyone's echocardiogram and we even put it into Martin St. John Sutton's central reading site, which is the most highly trained site in the world for reading echocardiograms. We cannot develop a model based on GA repeat length, age, and sex, which would explain everyone's change. That part of that is that people's ejection fractions and thicknesses get more and then they get less and you can't develop a linear model. That has been one of the limitations to moving forward with cardiac studies in FA is that we cannot have such a model and we cannot link to good to long-term outcomes. What does this mean? It means that echocardiograms will tend to underestimate disease. The ejection fraction, which is the most reliable sign, is a late changing feature on an echocardiogram in FA. That should actually make you even more comfortable with Elaine Puccio's work because I think the same thing is probably true in a mouse and if she's waiting until EFs change, she's waiting quite late to treat those mice. So practically speaking, cardiac status we can also tell you is not linked to neurological status. That is, they are largely independent events, except, the, except for the fact that they are both correlated with GA repeat length. And the other thing we learned in reviewing everyone's records as part of our natural history study is that a major cause of cardiac morbidity, morbidity is arrhythmias in people whose uh, echocardiograms are normal or relatively normal. That these things have clinical implications. First, you need Holter monitoring earlier, and you may need MRI scans as adjuncts to the management of things. Now, as Kim Lynn pointed out earlier, getting cardiac MRIs paid for by insurance companies in the modern era is not necessarily a guaranteed. I have a separate set of paperwork which should demonstrate that. But it's one of the things which we probably have to move ahead with doing. We've collected all this data on everyone. We know everything about you. Well, maybe not everything. What else comes out of our clinical network study? We have a defined cohort of subjects. We can ask questions about what medications everyone takes. For example, one of the companies that we're working with realizes that if they take their drug into people, they have to know about drug interactions, and particularly ones with uh, drugs that people take commonly. Well, what drugs do people with free rack ataxia take commonly? If we didn't do this study and re report that data which Jen has worked on, we wouldn't be able to tell people that. We need to know what antioxidants they can take so we know what we're going to have to tell people to withdraw if they're in an antioxidant study. We can ask about other medical issues. First, one researcher in Europe has been fond of reporting that based on test tube studies, Friedrich ataxia should be associated with cancer. We can say almost unequivocally that in those patients we follow, it is not associated with cancer. The risk of cancer in people with FA is no higher nor any lower than the general population. So it's not worth even thinking about this one. Notice this in capital letters. We can also do things like look at the association with pregnancy and the, across the cohort and, def, and come up with guidelines there. And you can ask about other things that influence the severity of Friedreich ataxia which we hadn't known about before through a technique called modifier gene analysis. Jim today talked about histone deacetylases and histone HDAC inhibitors. These control, uh, our epigenetic controls implicated in cellular and animal models. But if you really want to put one of these drugs into a person for therapeutic intervention, you'd like to have some evidence that they work in people as well, you know? 
that would reassure us that the risks were, potential risks were worth the potential benefits. You can do this through what we call modifier gene analysis. Essentially what we can do is use that natural variability in everyone by looking at natural occurring variability in the histone deacetylase genes in all of us through what we call polymorphisms or particular single nucleotide polymorphisms because they're easily looked at and see how that variability impacts people's disease. So what do we do? We took 218 samples of DNA from the people which I think people around here probably donated. We can then look at uh, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in the histone deacetylase genes, which are in your bodies, as well as the sirtuin genes, which are closely related genes. We can then look at some outcome variables. Neurologic skills, our FARS exam or performance measures. Some cardiac, uh, whether people have cardiomyopathy or not, whether they have scoliosis or not, and age and onset. And then we could do what we call regression analysis and basically account for the age of a person, their sex, their GA repeat length, and see if this modifier, which is a naturally occurring genetic variation in all of us, can it make the predictions of disease severity better? Well, we looked at five in particular which had some variants across the FA population, and this is not a slide to be memorized. It is a slide to be associated that yellow things make mean that that particular polymorphism, which is designated by that RS, da 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 that particular polymorphism predicted the scores of two different performance measure measures, the nine-hole peg test, the time 25-foot walk, and the FARS exam. So it predicted every neurological element above the level of GA repeat length, sex, and age. So these things in this particular gene, which happens to be sir 2 and 6, somehow are part of that 50% variability, which we cannot explain based simply on GA repeat links. So that's essentially what it means. We know something else which changes the phenotype and rate of progression of EFA. What does it do? It codes for a very specific variability for those people who are biochemists and asparagine serine variability. Uh, if you have asparagine and serine at these two genes, you do much better than the other group. This is involved in the sirtuin 6 histone deacetylase activity, which regulates pro genes and regulates their expression. So we would like to say that it regulates the expression of frataxin. The problem is it doesn't. It doesn't appear associated with frataxin levels at all, so it changes something else about people with Friedrich ataxia and impacts their rate of progression. That's a modifier gene analysis. We're working on what that exactly is, but we don't know yet. Some other results which can come out of that genotyping. Jim made reference to methylation status as being one of the other things which modifies for taxing gene expression. We did this study with our colleagues in Australia, and whenever I've italicized a reference here, it means I'm particularly proud of it because it's a group of individuals who are not at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia showing our collaborative nature. Well, they showed that methylation status can also predict the disease in the same way that SIRT6 polymorphism can. We can also look at People may or may not know that the GA repeat can have interruptions with it. We came to the conclusion that these eruptions aren't necessarily involved in the phenotype through a Kathy uh, study done at uh, CHOP. We can also use this large cohort to match our clinical disease with biological activities, so-called biomarkers. We must have these because these may be rapid response elements so that we can do clinical trials faster and understand why trials succeed and fail rather than th just that they succeed in trial. Things you can try. Well, in fact, the original study that Rob invited me to participate in in 1997 was a trial looking at iron-based biomarkers where we came to the conclusion with people who FA act as if they are iron depleted rather than iron overload. That's our first biomarker study. We can look at urinary markers of free radical production. The problem is we actually can't show free radical production or reactive oxygen species uh, uh, species production in urine. It's not sensitive enough to sort out from all that which we have every day. RNA, I mentioned Gian, uh, Giovanni's approach, and we have to have a me measure for, ta for taxin exposed, for taxin levels itself, if we're actually going to do a clinical trial raising for taxin. Fortunately, some other collaborators at Mitosciences, and we've been fortunate enough over the time to have lots of collaborators and lots of uh, private sector enterprises which has helped us move forward. 
were kind enough to have uh, just produced a so-called dipstick where you can take a sample out of solution like a cheek swab or blood, allow it to go up the dipstick, and then it can be t detected by what we call immunogold technology. This is a gold molecule which we can uh, uh, conjugate it to, uh, uh, which we can detect as a fluorophore in an immunogold reader. There is probably, I'm not sure how much gold it is and whether we should melt this down when we're done and maybe get some money back. But in any case, we can read this very sensitively, and we could do it in unaffected tissue, which is something you must do in Friedreich ataxia, because sampling the brain and heart directly is frowned upon. Uh, so we elected to do it because we do a lot of children, cheek swabs. You can do it in blood as well, but these are the people who are controls, which might include some individuals in this room. These are the people who are carriers significantly less, and these are the people with uh, GA repeat length Friedreich ataxia. 100% of normal, 50% of normal, about 15% of normal. Now, there are a couple other groups here. These are the patients I see who would give me a cheek swab and who don't have Friedreich ataxia, so they are matched for referral bias to me. Uh, and then two other groups here. These are the individuals whose triple repeat lengths are shorter and who have onset of Friedreich ataxia after the age of 25. And you can see they have lower levels of frataxin, but not as low as people with earlier onset, which is what you'd expect. They're even circled there. And then this group here are those individuals who carry point mutations. I was asked this at the break, so I will explain it. Most point mutation cause either absence of frataxin because they disrupt the RNA splicing, they have a start codon mutation so that they don't make any frataxin, or sometimes what they have is that they uh, make a protein which does not fold correctly and is rapidly destroyed. Several of them though, G130V, R165C, W155R, and I154F, actually make protein which should fold correctly. This is one of those individuals who actually has a relatively normal level of frataxin, it's an R165C, but it is dysfunctional. A group at Texas A&M has actually used that finding to understand a little bit more about the function of frataxin. I will note this individual has somewhat different clinical manifestations. We also were identify, able to identify individuals who looked like they had Friedreich ataxia, are dead ringers, but they only had one GA repeat length or point mutation. Two of those three individuals we discovered have a new type of mutation called a, a sizable deletion. And in one individual, we cannot find the second mutation yet. They have low frataxin levels, the same disease range, but we don't know where that, that second mutation is. When we find it, it might tell us a new way to treat disease. Very briefly, other biomarkers which you all have contributed to. This is a simplified version of the metabolism in your body. Remember, you have mitochondria every way, everywhere. As you eat and produce energy, a lot of that metabolism and how you degrade it is messed up. What we're looking to do now is look at specific pathways uh, which might be involved, which we can target either as markers or even as potential dietary therapies. Uh, there are a variety of different pathways, both those involved in carbohydrate metabolism as well as uh, lipid metabolism. We have a way to look at this in people now. I skipped the basic science data, but we didn't do this until we proved it worked in uh, test tube first. You can look at the platelets from people, which are, in isolate, uh, which are in easily isolated form, and look at the level of a particular molecule called succinyl-CoA, and the means are low in Friedrich ataxia patients and in others. This shows the metabolism is abnormal. We would like to uh, figure out what uh, potentially use this as a biomarker to study. But perhaps more importantly, we have, can figure out where it's coming from. This is your citric acid cycle, which gives rise to succinic acid. There are other ways you can get that. You can get it from fatty acid oxidation, or you can get it from anaplerotic breakdown of amino acids. Which of those are uh, different in people with FA? We're working on that right now by feeding people, or feeding platelets, I should say, labeled forms with heavy, uh, uh, heavy compounds, deuterated, uh, century, non-radioactive, where we can figure out where that 6 is coming, coming from so we can figure out the pathways that are involved and conceptually come up with a dietary approach to free brachytaxia. Uh, we know that that one doesn't particularly work. I have, those are biochemical biomarkers. I'll mention very quickly that we also want to know how cells are dying or going away. You know MRI scans are normal in people with free brachytaxia, but there's a point of the nervous system where we can look at which is not normal in FA. This is an infrared picture of the eye taken over the course of three seconds uh, in a normal individual. This is a person with free ataxia. It's called optical coherence tomography. 
This is the small retina, which gives rise to the optic neuropathy and Friedreich ataxia. Easily measured, almost everyone from FA, even if they have normal vision, is in fact abnormal, and we can use this as a cellular biomarker looking at central nervous system changes. So what is it all about? It's about this slide. This is the actual data from the A0001 study. So we did all those studies so that we can make this study doable and interpretable. And I'll use the actual data to illustrate the point. Placebo, middle dose, high dose. This is your FARS exam score here. On this, I'll go FARS exam score, time zero, day 28. Placebo, couple people get better, most people stay about the same. Middle dose, almost everyone gets better, a couple people stay the same. Active drug at high dose, everyone gets better by a mean average of roughly two years worth of progression. For a clinical trial, that is slam dunk data. We do not, in neurodegenerative disease, see that much of a differentiation. The, the p-value on this versus this has several zeros in front of it, and that's almost unheard of for a one-month trial. But it raises some questions. First, the most obvious one is, what happens if you keep going? Well, hopefully we'll find that out in the upcoming planned EPI 743 study, which is a close relative of A0001. What else is missing? Well, the biomarkers we designed in this study didn't work. They weren't different from normal, so I couldn't tell you whether they got better or not. So we don't have an explanation entirely on why this happened. It's wonderful that it did happen, but we don't know entirely why. So these are the things that we, reason we keep doing things and keep moving, doing more. So now, the past 15 years, 45 manuscripts, if you care about exactly about publishing, this is what my bosses care about. So I'll tab very quickly through them, and these are all your manuscripts because you have pa uh, participated in them. What do we not have? A clinical trial demonstrating unequivocal efficacy with unequivocal explanation. But to have that, there's always more development to do. So that's why we'll be back tomorrow seeing 11 more people and drawing lots more blood samples. We'll be collecting your echoes again tomorrow, and we now intend to go into one other area from which we will need your cooperation. It is possible that the most effective therapies are started very early, perhaps even before we might be destined to meet people. So if you're gonna treat someone before you meet them, how do you know it worked? There's sort of a logical problem there. We have to figure out what we're going to measure in those individuals so that when we get to that moment, we will successfully prove that those therapies are better than the potential side effects of those therapies. So these are the people, Rob gave you the small slide. This is the large slide of the people who have worked at CHOP and PIN in the FA program. And most importantly, thank you all to, for you, for your time, effort, thoughts, and of course your biological specimens. <laughs> this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, I, this is my friend Joanna. I don't know how she got me to wear this shirt. It says Notre Dame, I'm a University of Texas fan. <laughs> but the other important thing to see in this picture is her band-aid in her anterior fossa, showing that she gave blood successfully that day and still has a smile afterward. Thank you. And let's have Jim and Jen come back up here for questions.